So without any further ado, I would like to bring up Dan. Dan. Who's going to deliver his first message in front of people. And if he, honestly, I don't know. I don't know if you are or not, but I remember the first one that I did for Pastor Bill. I was terrified. Absolutely terrified. And I got through it, just as he will. And I, I'm not saying you are. You're probably not. <laughs> God, I love it. <laughs> I think the more uh, courage isn't the absence of fear. It is proceeding in the face of it. So he is courageous in the Lord. Amen. So, Dan, the floor is yours, sir. Thank you. Oh. So you were serious about doing this. So what I'm going to share with you are not, are not my words entirely. They're actually uh, uh, something that was written called The Seven Riddles of Life. There were two chapters in it, one called The Pulpit of the Cross, and the other is called The First Riddle of Life. That's what I'm going to share with you. It was written by Fulton Sheen. Uh, and, and so it all, you know, this message kind of starts back in 2005 to 2006. When I was sitting down watching a movie for probably the second or third time, the movie Troy. Does anybody remember the movie Troy? Okay, and, uh, and, and Dee and I were both sitting and watching it. It was also her second or third time, which was a little unusual. So uh, I remember I got up at, during a commercial, went to the refrigerator, came back behind the couch, and I thought, huh, I, I will usually watch these movies like The Patriot, they inspire me. Uh, but Dee is more of a one-and-done kind of person when it comes to a movie. She'll watch it and, okay, been there, done that, I don't need to see it again. But this was her second or third time, all right? And so just, as a, just to remind people, the movie Troy was really a Hollywood reenactment of an ancient epic poem called the Iliad, written by Homer. And, it, and in it, it had, uh, and the whole thing is about how the Greeks laid siege to a city of Troy. For 10 years, they had this siege. So we're in the 10th year of the siege. And so it all started when a prince of Troy by the name of Paris, played by Orlando Bloom in the movie, came, came to a, a Greek city, was smitten by another man's wife. The husband is a brother of a king, probably not a wise thing to do. She's played by, her name is Helen, and she's played by Diane Kruger. So they come back, so they run away together back into Troy, and the Greeks come after them. For 10 years, this has been going on. And so the brother of Orlando Bloom is Hector, played by Eric Bana. And, and so uh, when and then the hero, the hero of the Greeks, on the Greek side, is Achilles. And Achilles is played by... Uh, Brad Pitt. Okay. Who, who just said Brad Pitt? So, so sometime between 700 B.C. and 1000 B.C., the time between Isaiah and Solomon, one of the world's, considered one of the world's greatest poets, Homer, comes onto the world stage. And he throws into the face of history a challenge. Namely, how can a man be triumphant in defeat? And how can a woman be, victori be, be virtuous and glorious in her sorrow or suffering? So in two of his works, the Iliad and the Odyssey, I, had a, I, had the, I actually took the time to read them this fall. And they were almost like a poetic John the Baptist unconsciously preparing the way of the Lord. In fact, if you remember, in, uh, I, I, after I read that, I remember reading in John chapter 12 where, where the Greeks seek an audience for, with Jesus. 
And I was wondering, you know, is it possible that they were kind of somewhat inspired by what some of the themes of this poem was, that it helped them to relate to Christ in a way that they would seek an audience? It's probably out there somewhere, but it was just a thought that I had. And so in the Iliad, though, the sympathy of the reader, as it would normally be focused on the hero, it's not focused on the hero Achilles. It's focused on the conquered Hector, who he paints as being better than all men and even, even more important than many of the gods. And so the poem really ends when, when, not, uh, when, when Troy is sacked and defeated. But it doesn't really focus on any grand pageantry or parades. It doesn't even focus on the hero Achilles being killed, dying in the battle but rather it ends with mourning and lamentation over the battered corpse of Hector, out of whom the poem just has all this glorious attributes and characteristics of what a hero is supposed to be. And so as, as the hero of the Iliad is the conquered man, so Penelope in her Wise Penelope, Homer always says, wise, wise Penelope. She becomes the heroine in the Odyssey. And just to give you a backdrop, because you may not be as familiar with the Odyssey, if you're like me, you, wrote, you read it many years ago, probably in high school. Uh, so the Odyssey in Greek means voyages, but it's Odysseus. And it, re and it reads to me like a love story between Odysseus and Penelope. Because, because Odysseus is... He is also another hero on par of being a Greek hero, just like Achilles. So when, when, uh, when he goes to battle, he's been away for 10 years at Troy. On his way back, though, to try to get back to his wife, Penelope, he meets misadventure after misadventure. Because the god Neptune is, is, is angry at him, and every time he and his men step into the ship, they, go, they get further and further away from where they were supposed to be. So for 20 years, Penelope has been in kind of her loneliness and tears, kind of depressed, missing her husband. And, and as time went on in that last 10 years, no one's heard from Odysseus or his men. He's assumed to be dead. And he has a pretty big estate. And so the, the, uh, the custom at that time was that the eligible bachelors could start to seek and try to court the widow in the hopes of trying to get into that estate, right? And that's what happens, and, he's, and she's consistently called wise Penelope because she has this ability to keep her suitors at bay without causing resentment. And they scheme and conspire. They even, try, they even think about a scheme to try to kill the son of Odysseus. Anyway, Odysseus comes back and everything is fine, but one of the characters describes Penelope. It's almost like a, a script written right out of Proverbs 31 about the virtuous woman. And so for 20 years, she, she's in her loneliness and tears. And, and it seems that what Homer's trying to say is that even in the, even in the midst, even it wasn't so much that she was trying to honor some country code, but it had more to do with that, that, that the affirmation that faithfulness, love, and decency. We could use some more of that decency around today, couldn't we? It was really more of an affirmation of that in the, in the midst of the anarchy and the chaos of the suitor's world. And so... so from the Iliad and, and, the, and the Odyssey, you know, for uh, men, men and women just pondered, why, why is it that the, that the poet would want us to, to feel like it's worthwhile to be like, like the conquered Hector? Or why, why would he want women to strive to be like Penelope, virtuous in her suffering? And there was never an answer. There was never an answer. For a thousand years, never an answer. And as we read in, 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 the prayer team, in the prayer team in Ephesians, I love that verse where it says, but God, but God. When a man 
So the, the, that, that riddle as to how can a man be triumphant in, triumphant in defeat and a woman be glorious in her suffering was answered on a day when a man would unfurl himself upon a cross and who once said, In this world, you will have defeat and you will have sorrow. You will have trials and you'll have tribulation. <laughs> but take heart. Go ahead and say it. You know what he said. I have overcome the world. I have overcome the world. Triumph and defeat. And when a woman beneath that cross, who in her youth once said, May it be unto me according to your word. Must have felt like seven swords piercing her heart to watch her son up on that cross. And never before and never since, and certainly not here today, <laughs> was there ever a pulpit like the cross. There was never a preacher like the dying Christ. There was never a congregation like Golgotha. And there was never a sermon like the seven last words of Christ. The first riddle of life is, and tell me if you've heard this one before, how is it that a world made out of love contains hatred, anger, and persecution? Have you heard this one before? It's a big, it's a big question, isn't it? Hatred, anger, and persecution. The world's most common answer, especially in scientific communities, is that, well, it really traces back to our animal origins in that in order to survive and, pres and preserve life, survival of the fittest, one must take an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. I mean, after all, there is no God, so you got to take care of yourself. Makes sense. That's the philosophy underneath that. And we could, go, we could go around to a lot of different religions and philosophies, but always, 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 Christianity's answer is quite different. It reveals that evil comes from, our, or that hatred, anger, and persecution come from evil men who hate goodness. They hate even the reproach of goodness because it, it places demands upon them that they're unwilling to accept. So the greater the intensity of evil, the greater the fear of goodness. And that's why supreme goodness was nailed to a cross. You know, I don't know about you, but whenever I read about the crucifixion, I always think, we're, how many crucifixions have these people seen that were going up to Golgotha that day? They had seen them all before. And I would imagine every one of them fully expected to yell out blasphemies and curses just like all the other condemned criminals had, had done before. And who would have more of a right to protest that kind of injustice than he who even the wife of a Roman judge, the daughter of Tiberius Caesar herself who married Pontius Pilate, would say that just man have nothing to do with that just man. Nothing to do with that just man. And at that moment of the crucifixion, when a tree of his own creation was forced to turn against him in the form of a cross, when even the iron of the earth was forced to react against him in the form of nails. And when even roses rebelled against him as a crown of thorns. At the second, when a hammer and a sickle were combined together to cut down the weeds on Calvary's hill to erect a gallows so that a hammer could drive nails into the hands of love incarnate itself. All in the attempt of evil men trying to render powerless love's blessings on that cross. And it's at that second, Jesus 
reveals the answer to the riddle as to why there's hatred, anger, and persecution. He says, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Father, forgive them because they ain't got a clue. Kind of thing, right? Not only did it reveal people not knowing what they're doing because they turned away from the righteousness of God, but he also gave us the clue as to what is the right weapon of choice against evil. Forgiveness and love. Because behind that one statement, one of his final last words on the cross, there was a whole lifetime of teaching in the Gospels as to why men should love their enemies and not hate them. And the first reason is because God has forgiven us of sins, many more sins, and of a greater severity than what any of our enemies have ever thrown at us. In fact, I don't know if you're like me, but people I call my enemies, those who cut me off in traffic, are those really enemies that he's talking about? When somebody doesn't agree with me, enemy. Somebody cuts in front of me in in line, ooh, devil. I don't think that was really the kinds of enemies that that Jesus had had in mind when he was talking about, about love. Forgiveness. God has forgiven us. And when a, a person who feels that they need no pardon, that person is more apt to be the most unforgiving among mankind. Jesus said, only the merciful, only by giving mercy do you find it. It's a paradox. Only by forgiving you'll find forgiveness. It's a reflection. The second reason that Jesus said that we should love and not hate. Hatred, which is like a seed and grows like a weed. It's really to prevent the multiplication of hatred in the world. If you take a line of men where the first turns to the second and slaps them on the cheek, And then the second, out of anger, wheels upon the third and slaps the other, the next person on the cheek, and so on and so forth. Do you realize it only takes one? It only takes one to turn the other cheek to break that whole cycle of hatred. That's all it takes. And when a person does that, it's like you turn the other cheek and it's like you're saying, if I hate you, all I'm doing is adding my quota of hatred to the entire world. And this, I refuse to do. In fact, I'm going to take your hatred. I'm going to kill it right here and now. I'm going to drive it from even the face of the earth. And you know how I'm going to do it? Go ahead and say it. By love. love. I'm going to do it by loving you. You know, Pastor James always talks about how Jesus is both not just an example for us, if that wasn't enough, but he's also an example of us. And you know, the second time when, when Jesus was standing before Pilate, he never said a word, not a word. Remember the first time they had a discussion. And, you know, and, and, and the conclusion is that really Pilate, religion was really a form of uh, just a topic of discussion. But to Jesus and for us, it's about decision. And so when, when Pilate said, what is truth? and then turned his back on it. There was nothing left to be said. So when Jesus comes before Pilate the second time, he says nothing. And Pilate, whose whose father-in-law is Tiberius Caesar himself, says, you do not speak to me? Do you not realize I have the power to crucify you or to set you free. You know, all totalitarians seem to speak that way. And then Jesus breaks his silence. 
And he says, you would not have the power if it had not been given to you from above. And I don't know about you, but when I read that, there's, there's something else that Jesus says in the silence, to me anyway. It's like he says, you would not have the power if it had not been given to you from above. <laughs> I gave it to you. I gave you that power, and I submit to it. And when I think about back in Genesis 1, Elohim Yahweh himself, who spoke the universe into existence, submitted himself, gave authority of the creation because he had to. It had no authority to take him. He had to give it. When, when Jesus left this world, he gave a 90% reduction in the number of commandments that we had to follow. <laughs> we only have one. Love others as I have loved you. Love as I have loved you. If we would only just submit to it the way that he submitted to his, for, for, his, for his crucifixion and resurrection. And you know, when we start to fail to love, there's a tendency to kind of keep a distance from God. And when Jesus was washing the 24 feet of his 12 disciples. See, it wasn't just the feet of 12 disciples. It was 24 stinky feet. <laughs> right? He said something interesting. He said, guys, let me do this. You do not understand what I'm doing now, but you will. You will come to a place of it. And so they allowed him. One pair of feet he would never see again. The feet of a betrayer. Another pair of feet, a denier. He, was, he actually denied four times. He denied three times that Christ said, but in his initial denial of the denial of the denial of the denial, a denier. <laughs> so if you think you got it wrong, you know. A denial of the denial. Yeah. And I'm not talking about the river in Egypt. <laughs> uh, and then there were the 20 feet of 10 betrayers, or of uh, deserters, sorry. And every one of them, I don't know how it happened. If they all realized at the same time, you know, we have the, you know, we know Peter had, had an individual uh, conversation with Jesus and, and a restoration. I have to think that every one of the 11 that came to him had that same individual experience. And Holy Spirit brought them back to that place where they now understood, and they, they were in this place, ready to come. And Jesus was already standing there and said, what do you mean forgive you? I already did it. I did it back there. I already knew that you were going to have this epic fail, and I provided a way for it. So as we love and fail <laughs> and, and come back and forgive, it's a cycle. He wants us, he wants us in the fields that are white, that are white for harvest. Right. So you see, the true test of a Christian isn't how much, isn't how much he loves. I'm sorry. The true test of a Christian isn't how much he loves his family and his friends, even when they do things bad to you. That's not the true test. The true test is That's right. loving those, forgiving those who are hating you and persecuting you, especially for your identity That's right. with Jesus Christ. You see, God cannot write on the pages of a heart that are all scribbled and covered with hate. But he can write straight, just like he did with Job, whose theology was crooked, but he still loved. And God can even write straight on the crooked lines of our heart, as long as we love. And so, when we put love in where we don't find it, everyone starts to become lovable. There's this reflection thing going on. That's, a, that's the best way I can explain it. 
when you put in love with, for people that don't deserve it, you don't expect anything in return, you do, you do something, even if it's for your own family, something small. And you know, that it, just, it was negligence, willful and wanton. Just go do it anyway. Go take over that chore. Whatever it happens to be, start practicing it. Because when we start to put love in where we do not find it, when we start to reflect the divine image of Jesus, something happens. All of a sudden, everyone becomes lovable. So that's, that's it. Go and do likewise. I know we have a song. Uh, the, the, team, the team may have missed the cue a little bit, but that's okay. You prepared, but I guess we didn't. Yeah, it was the feet thing, you know. So. <laughs> So when I was thinking through this message, I had, uh, I had asked the, Emma and the worship team if they would sing, if they would sing this song because it just, it's just so applicable. We're actually going to ask you to stand in proclamation and join us for this morning.
Take your seats. Please take your seats. Please take your seats. 